Thank you so much for having me. Susan Tack. So let's start with a teaser, an overview. What does brain power do? These wonderful students who all have autism and have consented to be part of our presentations. The question is, what's engaging them? And they are engaged. What is this simple thing that we're doing? And how is it different from the comedic sketch that you just saw? And the simple answer, which I'll explain in detail, has everything to do with these computerized glasses, these augmented reality glasses. And in a simple way, a student puts on the glasses, interacts with the teacher, and gets points and rewards for pro-social behaviors like looking towards someone or controlling certain behaviors or understanding their emotions. So let's see this tiny teaser to explain this. Sean and his mother are in the BrainPower Boston office beta testing the emotion apps on the BrainPower system. First up, it's the emotion game. Will Sean be able to guess his mother's emotions? She smiles. He chooses happy with a head movement. Correct, you get a point, Sean. Now it's time for the second emotion. His mother is looking pretty neutral. Sean picks that option with a head movement. Nice job, Sean. On to the next app, Emotion Decode. The brain power system detects his mother's emotions and gives both audio and video feedback to Sean. Happy, sad, then back to happy. Oh my god, I'm so many <laughs> So we saw there an interaction. Is it a human interaction? Two people. And the computer is there to keep score and to keep motivation. I'll point that out in contrast to the comedic sketch with a virtual reality or VR headset. The augmented reality headset keeps the person heads up, hands free, and engaged with the other person. And so what's on screen in this case? What we saw first in the video was an emotion-related app, and that was actually the older interfaces. The video is a little bit older. But this one, this paradigm has to do with looking toward another person. So the feedback on screen has to do with a posture, a poise, and eye contact. I'll stress that it's beyond just eye contact, but this interaction and that heads-up posture of looking toward someone. How does it work? I'll demonstrate, just briefly uh, point out that in this upper left panel, the student is looking at the teacher or mother, and what he sees is this circle around the face. The augmented, I mean, the artificial intelligence finds the face 20 or 30 times per second and tracks it, circles it, makes it very easy for the student to interact, and importantly, keeps track of how long he is looking toward her and how long uh, maybe he's looking away. When that green, green circle completes, as in the upper right panel, a fun face comes over the teacher. And that's fun and engaging, and that takes, say, 15 seconds to earn. But in the next version, uh, in the next level, it takes 30 seconds. In the next level, on and on. Maybe it's a minute and a half. So it creates a delayed gratification. I'll go over in detail all of these, but I wanted to give first the overall paradigm. In the next one, this is that Emotion app, slightly more updated version of the software, the child gets two choices. Is she happy or sad or surprised? And he simply chooses by tilting the head. The accelerometer picks that up. And by the way, we use those sensors, like the accelerometer, to measure many things, including physiological signs of stress or distress. Now, in a third paradigm, the person sees a new place that he or she may not have experienced before. For instance, a classroom. 
You're going to a new classroom. That's always stressful for the students and for the teachers. And if I can experience a place before I get there, I can be more of an expert when I get there. Just as coming, for instance, to Oslo for the, uh, yesterday and coming to this venue for the first time, I had no idea how to expect what to see, what to feel, where the lights are, where the exits are. These things can cause stress. But if I can see it beforehand, I can get used to it. So what am I showing on screen here? This is a map of a classroom. It's a full spherical picture wrapped into this horizontal projection. And the color on top of it is a look map. What is a look map? It's where did the child look? So when the student is exploring the new classroom, you can ask, where is he or she paying attention? And what parts may be avoiding? We'll come back to the significance of that. In this video, pardon, I'll restart it. This video gives a little more of an overview in some of the use cases. And I think I probably say it better on screen there. So I'll defer to my own self and the rest of the team for, I think, a couple minute video. Brain power is important. Empowering. Magical. Groundbreaking. Brain power makes the world's first wearable system to help people with autism gain self sufficiency. Having a system like this, this would be amazing and, and put a lot of moms and dads at ease. I foresee her going someplace with the glasses and getting there, doing what she needs to, and coming back completely by herself. It's actually a life coach that's wearable, and that's the beauty of it. The minute he put the glasses on, he just lit up. He made connections with the entire team. And how'd that make you feel? It felt like I was a new man. Like it's the most amazing product in the world. Like and everyone should give it a try. I'm a graphic artist at Brain Power, and I'm on the autism spectrum. I really appreciate Brain Power's mission. I've just never seen anything like it. It's incredible. Brain Power is going to change the way you use your brain. Is that exciting? Does that sound good? You want to hear more? It's too early in the morning for all this. Well, let's talk about what we're going to say today. So here's an agenda for the talk because it's a slightly different kind of talk than, than I suppose usual. The first part, it's already done. That was the overview and teaser. Next, I'm going to talk about we as a group, and we're kind of a mission, we're a company, we're a lab, we're many things together, but where we are now and a little bit about the journey that got here. And in talking with the organizers ahead of time, there was a sense that it might be interesting to see how we go from basic research science back at MIT and Harvard into a product that can be useful in schools and what were the pitfalls of that journey. But then let's get into some of the details, talk about the research and the evidence that allows us to know that this is going to move the needle and help these students, and then talk about how one could implement it in schools, which we're doing in America, but presumably could be done uh, anywhere, and then talk about what other teachers like yourselves have said. So we know that autism is a, is a huge challenge the world over. Possibly 3.5 million people in America and 70 million worldwide. When you add in ADHD, which we also partially address, the numbers are, are enormous. And I think it's important to say, you know, what's the point? What is, what's relevant in terms of what the challenges are with autism? Autism is not a disease, for instance. Autism is a different way of thinking and a different way that your brain could be composed. But one thing that does really matter is that 80% of people on the spectrum end up unemployed. And perhaps up to 90% without consistently a romantic partner on whom to rely and, and in order to love. And these are very, very important aspects of the human condition held at bay. And why? Because sometimes there's no skill gap 
There's no one thing that the person doesn't know how to do to perform the job, for instance, but there is this social emotional challenge that leaves the person without access to some of those basic dignities and self-sufficiency in life. And so it's those challenges and therefore those skills that we address the most. Now there's a glimmer of hope in that many people on the spectrum notoriously love technology and that the children of today are used to technology and love it. Uh, and yet sometimes they can get lost. That screen time can be, in a way, a downside. And I'll contend that by keeping this a heads-up device and earning points only when you're interacting with another human being, that we're, in a way, the opposite of screen time. And that's the paradigm. Heads up, hands free, in a classroom, and engaging. These are all students. These are in their classrooms uh, and or a clinical setting in one or two cases. And you can see on screen students of different ages. What you might not be able to see is different levels of verbal expression, speaking and non-speaking students, and yet all interacting with a technology that really their parents never saw the likes of. And the, the students end up teaching their own parents uh, how, how to use. So you've seen this profile, right? This first student um, looking away, fidgeting a lot. And you can wonder, is he paying attention? I mean, I interacted with Ari. I know he was paying attention, but you couldn't tell. And these are some of those things that if that visible sign of attention is not there, then the person might not be taken for as competent or uh, attentive as he or she actually is. But then with this system on that gives motivation, that gives points, that gives rewards, and that also gives reminders of some of these basic behaviors like looking towards someone, then the paradigm is different. And this is just one still frame, but let's look at this in terms of data and in terms of statistics, one way of doing that is this kind of map, which I call a fidgetograph, meaning how much fidgeting is happening. And on, on the left, um, we have this child who has autism and ADHD dual diagnosis. And you see over the course of several minutes, this blur, right? And then quantified in terms of pitch, yaw, and roll of the head underneath. And then, now let's look for five minutes while the same child was talking to the same adult and yet was getting this motivation and reward through the system. Do you see any difference? I mean, of course, this is something you can observe when you observe someone in the classroom over the course of many minutes. But summarizing it in this one picture really brings the point home that the student is on task and giving signs of being on task. So when we went into schools, we found that not only the teachers were interested, but the superintendents of the whole school districts have, have autism top of mind. This is really, really a big topic for everyone. And the next video was submitted to a competition that's yearly by a superintendent of schools and it became the winning video in this competition, so we were happy about that. And it also explains in his own words why he used it in his district. I'll also point out that he's using it with his own son, who's on the spectrum. I'm Patrick Daly here at North Reading Middle School, and here's my cue clip. So right now I'm using Empowered Brain on Google Glass to learn more about social-emotional learning. It's so important for all of our students, and this tool is really groundbreaking because instead of looking down at a video screen with the Google Glass that they're wearing, they're making real eye contact with an actual person and determining the facial expressions of an actual person that's sitting right in front of them, which is pretty amazing. This is a great tool that we're using in one of our programs for kids that are having some trouble and some anxiety as a part of Empowered Brain. I'm so happy to share this with our MassQ community. What's so cool about using this program is that the students are not only learning all the social-emotional skills of self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, building relationship skills, responsible decision-making, 
but they're also very much covering the digital literacy and computer science standards because they're using Google Glass and they're aware of the digital tools that they're using for collaboration, which is the, one of the standards. They're aware of the way computers are being used in society because they are using cutting edge technology in the classroom to reinforce these social emotional learning skills, which is just absolutely an incredible experience for these students. The curly haired child you saw in the middle, that was his son. And he recently spoke at another conference, this superintendent talking about how this really matters and even some of the visual and uh, I guess muscular tics that he sometimes has fade away during the sessions. So we've gotten to a place now where we have partnerships with other entities, Google, who makes the hardware, but also does a lot with uh, very cool artificial intelligence, and Amazon, Amazon Web Services, for their artificial intelligence and machine learning. Also a company called Affectiva that built the face um, analysis profile so that you don't have to base a judgment based on maybe a cards that you'd use or Ekman faces. You don't have to base the judgment on anecdotal evidence, but they've used 100 million different face impressions over time to train the classifiers and models so that it's culturally, uh, cross-cultural, and very detailed AI. In any case, we also partner with uh, universities, including Harvard and MIT, where I had the privilege of studying, and Stanford and others. We've been given a number of awards for business from the autism community, for the scientific research, and been covered in the news many times um, in some of the major news outlets. And just, in fact, last week on CNN uh, over in Zurich. But I point that out to say that we've gotten to a place where the work is in schools and it's happening and, and this is actually having this demonstrative results for people on the spectrum. But it took a long time to get here. And so now I want to talk about the, uh, the journey a little bit, if, if it's of interest. So let's go back in time. I'm going to use a little time machine. Do you have time machines in Norway? No? OK, well, we're going in this time machine to where it all started. Oh, wait, wait, no, that's too far back. We don't need to go that far. Um, so let's bring that time machine forward and just talk about, uh, before starting this, I personally was an academic researcher, and the thought there was to become maybe a professor. But then there was a the feeling that I could publish papers, but could I or any team behind me do something that would matter for the daily lives of these millions, literally millions and millions of students on the autism spectrum? And so I took a leap of faith off that cliff to do something very different and start this group, this company, and kind of a lab within a company. And it's called Brain Power. And we focus on invisible challenges to autonomy. So autism is invisible in the sense it's not an injury, it's not something that is visible, same with a brain injury, and and depression. These are invisible, but they get in the way of life if you don't have the right skills and tools. And so on this journey, one of the most important things we did was go out there and listen. We talked to teachers. We talked to people on the spectrum. We talked to families. We talked to moms. We talked to doctors. And we talked to occupational therapists, speech and language therapists, and BCBAs, and so forth, and listened. And of course, as everyone knows, with autism, there is such a diversity. There is a range of possibilities. And as typified by this collection of many ages and many abilities of people who, in the early days, beta tested what we were doing, there is a lot of human drama. There is a lot of very deeply personal aspects to this. I'll point out that something I kept hearing from teachers and especially from parents was, yeah, the parents, they're not terribly worried of whether their son or daughter would increase 5% on history or math scores in school. Sorry to the history and math teachers. 
But what they worry about is what happens when I die? Should I be building a college fund for the future or should I be building out the basement? And these are very deep existential questions and they come down to that self-sufficiency journey. And so we designed a platform based on the, the brain science, also based on the practicalities of bringing tools of behavior change to people who have these challenges. So why would we have picked this augmented reality? And, and thank you for playing that video beforehand because it's perfect. Because uh, do you really want to have a social conversation with the person on the left? No. He's blocked. The world is blocked and he's blocked from the world. And as you saw, if I were wearing those virtual reality glasses now, I'd be in great danger right at this moment of falling off the stage. But with augmented reality, with such a light device, that's not an issue. I'm right here and I see the world. And there are augmented reality devices like the HoloLens, which is the one second from the left, but that's also very big and cumbersome and about 15 times the weight of this. But we asked the children, we asked the students which ones they would prefer. And this thing, this Google Glass, that you may have heard about but didn't necessarily get to try, by the way, I'm doing a workshop this afternoon if anyone wants to try. This has quite a lot in it. This computer contained here is more powerful than the one I used to use in college. And it has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and an accelerometer and a gyroscope and a magnetometer and a good CPU, um, a little camera here that can measure blinks and things like that. So that sounds like a very sophisticated device. Maybe you'd be a little worried about it being near children. Here's something interesting, watch. And I do that every time I talk, and they don't break. It would take quite a willful child to do so. It has this amazing titanium alloy, can fit on any head, um, very strong and durable, and yes, it still works. So anyway, this is important for children, and that's the platform, but then it took so much time and work and commitment to really understand the needs and get out there. And sometimes I ended up sleeping under my desk. I didn't subject that on to the rest of the team, but one thing I subjected the rest of the team to, or at that time a few members of the team, was to really get out there. They say to understand how best to serve people, you have to go and be amongst those people. And so I bought an RV, a recreational vehicle, and a few of the team members and I lived in it for part of a summer and traveled around the country to West Virginia, to Missouri, to Tennessee, to parts of the country that aren't really well represented on that map where I showed the Harvard and the MIT and all the wonderful research centers. So got out there and listened and heard. And so what was the point? It was to understand the needs and the commonalities amongst people and students on the spectrum and how to address them. So a few times had a near-death experience in the company and then launched a crowdfunding and that was able to catapult us further and then we delivered all those orders on time and then transition to schools. And schools fit our mission better than the home direct customer. And the reason is that educators like you are highly capable, highly tuned to your students and can use a new tool like this to do your own job that much better. And that job I'm saying is the teaching and the reminding, but also the data collection. I didn't stress enough yet that everything we do generates a huge amount of data. Things like the angular deviation between my head and someone else's as I'm looking toward them or not, and the thousands of times potentially that I looked away and looked back, or my blink rate, or my breathing rate, or how well I'm performing on the emotion games. So now we're spreading to schools around, in this case, Massachusetts and other parts of our country, and the team is expanding. And so what we're able to do is get feedback and bring in even new product features. For instance, in the Transition Master, which I'll cover a little bit more now, that gives you the ability to feel the space 
what customers told us, in addition to space, we want to hear the sounds. And so we've built in that auditory nature of the other environments so that people can get acclimated beforehand to loud sounds. So what is this? The ecosystem, there is the device, the wearable device, and there are apps that run on it, each one focused on a skill set that students on the spectrum can benefit from. And then there are apps on the phone. And underneath or behind the scenes is the secure data cloud where all of the reports are generated, where you can download information to go in what we call the IEP reports, the Individualized Educational Program, of which I'm sure you have something similar in Norway. So let's touch on some of the apps. Right now, one of the most popular ones is called Face-to-Face. -face. And with Face-to-Face, -face, that's where we get feedback on looking toward other people. So what's that important for? You don't need to look towards someone to calculate his or her finances, but in order to pass the job interview to get the job as a CPA, you might need to look towards someone to indicate that you're interested or to find out whether that person is interested. And that's a simple concept, right? But it bears stating as to why we want to encourage eye contact or face-directed gaze. Likewise, for getting a date, which is a sort of interview, and to get to the next stages of that process. Not only does face-directed gaze or eye contact indicate attention, it gives the person the information that the brain can only derive from signs that are on the face. And that's also important. Right now, there's no objective measure of what constitutes attention or the visual signs of attention. So what the person sees on screen we saw before is something like this, an incomplete circle that completes around the face. And when it does, there's the reward. And there's an ongoing point score. And I'll t say one thing, that the points come in several uh, categories is what I term micro successes, which are very easy to obtain. You get the points fast, and that builds confidence, and that gives this little sense of success that it is very fleeting and rare for these low agency and usually feeling like something has gone wrong students. And then these larger rewards or merit badges are delayed gratifications. These are macro successes. That's to say something for which you need to work harder and carries with it a larger reward. That's true in all of our games. After you play a session, the data are streamed to the secure cloud. And in fact, in some games, it's happening in real time, so teachers in different parts of the school can monitor something like this. So what are we seeing on screen? I'll call attention in the upper right to the attention score, which is an aggregate score, for instance, here, 77.5%. That's how much time the person is showing visible signs of attention. And that the ongoing data get to the deep granularity of each and every time that a person looks toward another or looks away. I'll just point that out briefly. With the laser, I'm pointing to the second to last figure, and there are the green and yellow dots. Yellow means a face has been lost and green has been found. There's no way that a BCBA or someone can write down each of those hundreds of episodes. And if doing so, she wouldn't be paying attention to the student. This is a different level of data than have been able to be captured before. And then we can see progress over the months as well as during a day. So the next skill is emotional literacy, understanding the emotions of others, and understanding the emotions of your own self. We generally collect data non-verbally about others, and we can action on the data. But if we never get the data in the first place, meaning understanding how someone else is feeling and how that maps to how they behave, then we cannot possibly 
interact in a way that the other will feel like they are being heard. So we look at learners, students, who have very differing levels of ability in this, and we have an app that addresses at much of that range. So that my point there is that while people have different skill levels, they can stay within the paradigm of our emotion literacy program and graduate up until they can really complete and move off. All of our games have that philosophy that you shouldn't be on the game forever. The game is there designed to have you get off the game when ready. It automatically fades back. So this we saw before is the paradigm. You choose the emotion based on a head tilt. The data from the Emotion Charades game represent their emotional progress, and this is progress in terms of decoding simple emotional expressions, as well as more complex interactions. For instance, when the teacher might say to the student, yeah, that's right, that was my sad face. What are some things that you think make me sad? It's a pretty advanced level of processing to have the theory of mind and perspective taking to contemplate what this adult, in fact a teacher, could be saddened by. So now let's take transitions. Now, transitions refer to many different things. It can be a transition to a new classroom for the year. It can be a transition to the job environment. But it can also be a transition into the hallway. You know, especially for high school students, right, that crushing, crowded hallway, if that's the same here, that's pretty stressful. Or the lunchroom, or field trip, whatever it is. Um, show of hands, are transitions kind of a stress point for students? You have very calm students. I'm not seeing enough hands. Okay, there's some more. Well, with the transitions, what we give is this ability to see, through this device, a classroom or a scenario beforehand. So what the student is looking there, we can't see until you see what's in his eye, and that's another classroom with the photo taken from his height. And as he looks around, we're mapping where he's exploring and where he's avoiding, and then he can actually transport from room to room and get familiar. This is a digital scavenger hunt. They get points for exploration, and eventually when they get to the actual environment, they can be more comfortable. The data you get, as we saw, become a look map, and a look map gives you that statistical probability density of exploration. So let's hear. This is something that students have experienced. They're using this in schools now. And let's hear from the voice of one student of why he thinks it would be valuable. Help them out. If I got to see the new school beforehand, I would probably see less stressed. Maybe. I have high anxiety. Maybe, um... If it was a little hard to hear, he said, if I could see the school beforehand, I would probably seem less stressed. And he says, I have high anxiety. He was a young student. He feels that, and it feels very stressful for him, and this is something that he can abate with this. So going over some of the philosophies of the games, of the, the system, they're gamified. Video games, we know, engage young people. And when I say young people, I mean people under the age of 100. Because we all like some kind of games. But video games can also be dangerous and addictive. So we take the good part, that motivational part, and we avoid the addiction, and we build in this ability to fade back the services. And focus on the micro successes to build confidence and macro successes to build that delayed gratification and focus on the skill. You get data that you can use in your classroom and you can increase the sense of agency that the students have. Agency, that ability to take action on life rather than life happening to you. 
With exposure therapy, which is known through the literature to be useful, we get to give that ability and confidence to exist in the new environment, and we focus on the needs of the parents and the teachers. So those are the basic facts and, and how the system works. I want to go into now the evidence that the system works. So what we have, first of all, are some research papers. As a company, we publish research papers because at the core of it, we're scientists, we're nerds. We want to know how things work. We want to know that things work. So we've published 12 papers now in peer-reviewed medical research journals. That's a lot more than most educational technologies. I won't go into too many boring details, but what I want is to convey the idea that you can trust the evidence, that the evidence speaks for itself, that there is something impactful in the educational environment here. This side slide summarizes research benefits from all of those papers. I think there are nine cited here. If we look on the left, these are some of the factors that are improved. Furthest to the left, we have social communication and social motivation, social engagement and social cognition, all real hallmarks of autism and ADHD. And to the right, these are the things that are reduced, which in this case is a the positive direction, the correct direction. That's irritability, very strongly. Restricted and repetitive behavior, hyperactivity and inattention. So we're increasing some of the pro-social factors and decreasing some of the things that would get in the way. These are all on the website, so you can look and inspect the papers themselves. Then there's a very important question you could ask in terms of the research. Does this effect generalize? By generalize, I mean, if I do this for 15 minutes a day, am I going to improve from one day to the next? Am I going to have skills that carry over or skills that only stay in the game? Right, this is the generalizing piece. And so this is very important to us. This figure summarizes the apps and the ways in which the effects generalize or extend outside of the game itself. I also mentioned future studies here. Even of the 12 papers, there are places that we want to go with research. We have a study at UCLA and another one at an autism clinic in New Jersey that sees 1,000 patients with autism per year, and another study at a school for the very extreme cases, the more medically fragile, nonverbal, uh, high behaviors people with autism. That's called the Melmark School. And so those studies are coming, and stay tuned for the further information. But the main point is we asked a series of basic questions and we answered them with peer-reviewed, IRB-controlled research. Those questions start with the simple. Will kids with autism wear something on their head? You could wonder. We wondered and we did the research. And the answer is most definitely yes. 91% of students, even if their own Teachers and parents said, oh, but he doesn't even wear sunglasses. Why would he wear that? Well, there's an answer to that. Sunglasses just create some contrast boundary. But these glasses turn the teacher into an angry bird. It's kind of funny. And more importantly, they work towards this pro-social behavior that's deeply important. I will pass through some of the research here because I noticed that my timer seems to be different from the timer there. Uh, we're probably trying to catch ourselves back on schedule. So the research goes into every major question you might want to ask. Please look at it on the website. Then I want to ask this question for your point of view is how would you implement this in your classroom? And there are a few different kinds of classroom paradigms. I think what we call an inclusion classroom, it's the same word here. And in an inclusion classroom, students of all abilities are, are mixed, 
and we've seen a lot of success with teachers using the system inside the inclusion classroom. There's also a substantially separate classroom. I think that's called a segregated classroom here, although that means something different in America. And we have this paradigm. All of the paradigms that you'll see on screen in the next few seconds are, these are cartoons, but they are based on classrooms that are using the system right now in different parts of America. And what you saw flash by there were several paradigms, archetypes of how to lay out a classroom and how to do this point of instruction during the day. Importantly, I don't think I was clear enough before that this instruction is 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes per day. The glasses don't live on the person all day. This is something that's a focused instruction. So I have here written several things, which maybe with the slides you can read later. These are statements by people who've used the system. I have a couple videos along those lines, so I'll go briefly through them. What do you think? Two thumbs up? Yes. I asked him, why are you this smiling is so much? And he said, eye contest. Oh. And he had the biggest yeah. smile on his face the entire time to the boss. Just staring oh at her, smiling. Steady eye contact. If I, if I moved, does it change? He's telling him one-on-one, -on -one, I have to wear the glasses. That was excellent. It was perfect. No, I, mean, I think that can be a useful tool for not only keeping the student engaged, but building life skills as well in terms of making eye contact and socializing. And one final moment. Now, this was a very emotional one. This was during one of our clinical trials. We had uh, PBS NewsHour camera crews there. And the mother, interacting with her own child, had this moment of epiphany. And I was in the room. It was. Uh, just made my hair stand up in an emotional way. And I'll kind of end on, on her own words. I'm going to cry. <laughs> Why? <laughs> when you look at me, it makes me think we haven't really before, because we're looking at me differently. <laughs> It was an amazing moment. She says she's going to cry because her son is now finally looking at her in a way that she'd never experienced. And that's almost ironic because he was using a computer to do it. And yet he was more human to human connected than ever before. And that's why we do what we do. And so these are the smiles and that's what we're here for is to increase that social communication, that human connection, and as we say, to empower every brain. So thank you very much.